Here's to whiskey kisses, the peachy taste of sin. It's whiskey time. Whiskey folk, and welcome back once again to Drinking Out Loud. As ever, I am your host Adam Bradshaw, and I'm here solo this month. Uh, we're being uh, being responsible with the surging numbers of COVID nineteen cases here in BC, and uh, I won't be sharing the couch with anyone today. So, uh, hopefully, I'll be sharing at least the live chat with some of our members. Uh, greetings to everyone who's watching along. Uh, this is the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society September outturn for two thousand and twenty. We've made it to September, guys. Um, and for me, September is the start of whiskey season. So uh, I think this is a great way to start whiskey season. Although you might be wondering why I'm starting whiskey season with a rum. Uh, well, first of all, I, uh, I, I've i been on a bit of a, a, a voyage of self-discovery this year. Discovering some fantastic alternatives. And uh, I... Uh, I wanted to revisit this beautiful rum that we had way back at the beginning of the outbreak, back in uh, back in April. We had this beautiful Panamanian rum, and uh, yeah, I I think now is a great time to revisit it. I, I think rum's an interesting drink because to me, unlike whiskey, which is stereotypically much more seasonal, uh, much more fall and winter, uh, maybe spring, but much more a fall and winter drink, rum. It's kind of all year round. I mean, it goes in a lot of very summery cocktails, but at the same time, it also goes in eggnog. Um, and because of those flavors having those, uh, those those very much seasonal connotations, I think rum on its own straight somehow, slightly more so than whiskey, works whatever the season is. So if you're desperately hanging on to summer and you're not quite ready to give in to fall yet, then this rum might be the perfect choice for you. Or uh, if you are over summer, you think, you know, good riddance, uh, I'm, I'm glad to get rid of that heat, I can stand outside without getting burnt, and the leaves are turning a beautiful colour. Welcome fall. I think rum is also a fantastic choice. Um, and this is a really interesting rum as well. I got an awful lot of um, the very stereotypical rum notes from this, but I found it to be a lot more... Um, a lot more creamy and, you know, butterscotchy than, than a lot of rums I've had recently. Um, and a part of that is because the distillery um, that this rum uh, is from exclusively matures in ex-bourbon casks. So you're you're going to get that same effect as you would with um, an ex-bourbon scotch of that, uh, that more buttery um, vanilla kind of flavor coming through. So let's take a look at this guy. It's called chili cho uh, yeah, chocolate chili combo, not chili chocolate, which... 
I feel like chili chocolate combo sounds better, but chocolate chili combo it is. Um, it's comforting, warm, sweet and spicy aromas followed by chewy dark chocolate, chipotle chili pepper, brownies, and freshly lit hand-rolled cigar. Oh, that does sound a little bit like fall, doesn't it? Um, yeah, 13-year-old Panamanian rum. Uh, interesting um, Panamanian rum as well. It's 62.1, I believe it says here. 62.1% ABV, uh, R9.4. And uh, yeah, R9.4 um, is, is its code. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with what on earth I'm talking about and what the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society is, they bottle single malt spirits, predominantly whiskey, that's it's in the name, um, from all over the world. And they give them a code um, a code that is relatively easily decipherable these days with the, the internet, um, but a code nonetheless so that you don't prejudge the spirit based on uh, preconceived notions of what you think it's going to be. Um, so, I mean, most people will have no idea what this uh, what this rum is just by uh, calling it R9. A lot of, you know, <laughs> long-time SNWS geeks might well know that R9 happens to be Varela Hermanos. I didn't know I had to look at the piece of paper behind the camera there. But this is Varela Hermanos from Aronabuelo. Um, probably butchering the pronunciation there, but a really interesting rum, uh, like I said, from Panama. Um, and it was actually founded in 1908, so it's got quite a long history to it, this one. Um, the family that owns it grows their own sugar cane, which is quite unique. And as I mentioned before, they exclusively mature in ex-bourbon barrels, which makes them quite an interesting and unique spirit. And I think a great way to kick off what is going to be a very, very interesting outturn. We've got seven new releases. We're, we're back into uh, we're back into the full schedule now. We've got seven brand new releases for you here today. And I cannot wait to, to share these with you. Uh, before I do though, I should mention um, how this works. We will be talking about these releases. I will be telling you what they are. And at the very end of this video, I will be clicking a big red button, um, not on the video, but in real time after the video is aired, because this, this isn't live. That's how I'm also in the live chat, just so you know. Um, I'm, I'm not magic. I am magic, but I'm not that kind of magic. Um, so when I, when I say these whiskeys are live at the end of this video, that means they are for sale at strathlicker.com forward slash SNWS. And I keep having to pause there because I keep wanting to say they're at sale at SNWS.ca. And no, no, SNWS.ca is where you can get all kinds of fantastic information about the club here in Canada, but it's not where you buy them. You can buy them um, at one of four stores, either uh, the Strath, which is uh, who I represent here in Victoria, British Columbia, um, also at Legacy in BC over in Vancouver, uh, Keg and Cork in Edmonton, and Kensington Wine Market in Calgary, of course. Um, but yes, uh, when I say go, they are available at Strath liquor.com forward slash SNWS. That is uh, the, the page for all SNWS members to see everything that has uh, just been released and uh, stay up to date with when the next outturn is and all of the all of the news and uh, exciting releases. Um, but this one doesn't need to be waited to be released because this has already been released, right? So I, I may as well just tell you the price now. It's uh, $192.96 for this fabulous 13-year-old single cask rum, one of only 250 in existence. Um, I I, re I recommend it. If you're a fan of rum, I think this is a beautiful rum and uh, would be a great addition to any any rum collector's shelf or uh, a great a great solo act for any whiskey drinker who feels like they need to start branching out and uh, enjoying some other spirits, some alternatives. Um, yeah. Without any ado, I best uh, I best get moving on to the very first of our new releases. And today, I have the official Outturn booklet here. So I'm going to be uh, taking all of my notes and reading about these whiskies right here. And we start off the day with something quite wonderful sounding. Well, I'm going to take one more sip of rum before I... That is good. All right, I'll move this out of the way. Today we're starting off with candy floss and carousels. Aromas arrived with a peppery tingle, a combination of chili, chocolate, and peppercorns. See what I did there? We just had chili chocolate. Yeah. Um, that drifted towards carnations, but with overtones of beeswax polish and dripping candles. On the tongue, it was a step back in time with all the fun of the fair, spinning on wooden rides with the sweet character of candy floss and toffee apples heavy in the air. Honey and vanilla merged into digestive biscuits, and oily notes suggested creamy ghee. 
Water released more confected characters of lemon drops and barley sugars that had stuck to the polished wooden decking of a waltzer fairground ride. Waxed lemons came through beside ripe pineapples and melon, whilst on the palate, more pronounced oaky notes took hold. That sounds lovely. Um, yeah, I'm all in. Let's, uh, let's, let's see what we've got. So, we're starting with a blue one. We're starting with Juicy Oak and Vanilla. And today we're starting with 26.136. And yeah, this is one of the new new bottles, newly designed labels. Let's crack her open and see what she's all about. Oh, I get to do the pop again. I was quite jealous of Brett doing all the popping. Ooh, yes. Satisfying. All right, let's find myself a Glencairn. Let's see what she's all about. Hmm, nice golden color. Pop you over here. All right. Hmm. So let's tell you a little bit about this whiskey in terms of the facts and figures. She's a Highland. Uh, from a second fill barrel, eight years old, from the 19th of September 2011. One of 254 bottles with an ABV of 59.6%. And if you didn't catch that all as I said it, don't worry, we'll be putting a screen up soon with that information again, so uh, don't fret, you don't have to rewind, you can hang on, it'll all be written down on the screen for you in a minute. Let's get my opinions on this, let's, let's, let's see what we're all about. Suggesting to look for a peppery tingle on the uh, on the early nose there. I'm not sure I'm quite getting that. I am getting the more floral. It says uh, the carnations and the beeswax polish. That's that's definitely definitely more the direction I'm personally finding right now on this one. Smells smells lovely. Uh, it smells very much like something that is a perfect start to a whiskey drinking evening, or the perfect end to a beer drinking evening. It's that kind of could go either way. Oh, that is honey. That's honey is the mm, slightly singed honey is absolutely the most prominent thing on the palate for me straight off. What else can I get in there? What else does it mention? Wooden rides. I've never eaten a wooden ride. Uh, toffee apples. Yeah, yeah. I could, I could see where they're coming from with toffee apples. That's certainly certainly the right kind of wheelhouse of flavour. Hmm. Mm. It does have that nice thick viscosity that you, uh, you you often come to expect from this distillery. Um, speaking of distillery, some of you might not know what 26 is. Should I enlighten you? Probably. So 26 is Kleinleash, one of my absolute favorite distilleries. And fun fact, the first SNWS bottle I ever purchased for myself was actually a Kleinleash. Um, this Highland Malt is known for its waxy flavours, which apparently come from a buildup of oils in the faints receiver, which they uh, don't clean. <laughs> um, sounds sounds not great, but the effect is great. Um, it's just oils. Oils won't hurt you. Um, the jury is actually out on when it was founded, however. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, we should probably put it up to a vote here um, here on Drinking Out Loud in the live chat. Um, it'd, be, it'd actually be great to hear you guys' opinion on uh, on what counts as the official founding date for this, because the original Klein Leash Distillery was founded in 1819, making it very old. However, in 1968, they built a brand new distillery. And normally, you know, this happens quite often with distilleries, and it makes sense. Um, normally, you'd give them a pass and say, yep, yeah, if you've moved across the road or something, we'll count you as the same distillery, right? It, it makes sense. However, in this case, it's not as cut and dry as that, because that old distillery um, actually took on a, a new name. It was originally Kleinleash B and then became known as Brora after it started making heavily peated malts for a period uh, during uh, during a bit of a dry period for, for Isla. They were pulled in as the reserves to make heavily peated malts for blends. Um, and it was actually known as Brora right until it closed in 1983. And, you know, a lot of you know now that Brora is a legendary closed distillery of high quality. Well, it's really... Kleinleash. Kleinleash and Brewer are basically the same thing. They're, you know, same same basic recipe apart from the peated brewers, of course. Um, but the same basic uh, recipe, the still size, the, 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 the 
the specs of distillation were the same across them both. But they are actually reopening Brora um, in the next couple of years. Hopefully, COVID hasn't uh, hasn't delayed that too far. But uh, yeah, the plan is uh, in a couple of years we will have a new Brora distillery, um, which is quite exciting. Um, well. I think it's the same Brewer Distillery, just refurbished and reopened. I don't think they're building a brand new one. Um, but either way, Brewer is coming back. But in the meantime, Kleinleash, I think, just as good. Um, and <laughs> theoretically, better, because it's available. And it's a hell of a lot less expensive than a Brewer, I'll tell you that. Um, so yeah, it's up to you. What do, what do you guys think? Do you think 1819, when the original distillery was built, or do you think Kleinleash, as we know it and love it today, is actually from 1968, and it's Brora that started in 1819? It's it's a tricky question, not one that I feel qualified to answer, but uh, let's see if we can get a consensus in the live chat. That'd be kind of cool. Mm. I don't have Brett here to talk to today, so I've got to talk to you guys instead. Although Brett might be in the live chat. Hi, Brett. I miss you, buddy. You're right downstairs right now, I think, as I record this. So you're not too far away. <laughs> we were playing with the idea of having Brett here, but sat in a mask, not being able to actually drink anything. I thought that would be more torturous. And, you know, let him off the hook on that. I'm not just going to sit here and drink whiskey in front of them. That seems poor taste. Although I guess we could have taken it in turns, but, yeah. <laughs> I'll make sure he gets to try some of them. Hmm. But, yeah, I think that's a gorgeous climb leash. I'm uh, excited to see what's coming up next. Let's pop this over here. Actually, move the bottles down here. I'm going to run out of space on the table. Alrighty, bottles down here. Drams over there. Let's see. Our third whiskey today. Um, second of the new releases, but whiskey number three in our uh, ordering system here. Because I'm counting that rum as whiskey number one somehow. That, it makes sense. Trust me. <laughs> uh, but whiskey number three today is called... Bodybuilders in ball gowns, which um, sounds great. Um, we, ha we have a very vibrant uh, drag scene here in Victoria, so uh, bodybuilders in ball gowns would not be a uh, unfamiliar sight, completely, to be honest. Um, <laughs> let's see how it tastes, So, mm. According to the uh, Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, this is a delicately scented veil of ladies' perfume shrouded Old aromas that smacked the senses with cinnamon and sanded oak. Enjoying bags of character, we soon found ourselves bench pressing tea cakes and deadlifting marshmallows on a floor of dusty tobacco and biscuit crumbs. You know, I, I reckon I could do that. I reckon I could deadlift a marshmallow. I think I can do that. Uh, then the palate muscled its way in with a full punch bag of fresh ginger, sweet spices, and aniseed. After a refresh and a dash of water, we found ourselves back again in powerful perfumes, but this time alongside crushed nettles in a herb garden and assorted biscuits laced with vanilla. Sweet honey began to emerge with a spice that built from nutmeg and ginger to cinnamon and camphor. Whilst on the finish, we found big and heavy-hitting wood. Hmm. There's something about a whiskey called Bodybuilders in Ball Gowns and then finishing with the, the line big and heavy hitting wood that's slightly disconcerting i've got to be honest um <laughs> i can't wait to try this this is a distillery that um recently discovered um i quite like through the snws and a, dis a distillery which uh, i think i'm pronouncing correctly um and we'll get to that later but for now it is just simply known as 95.36 9536 all righty Glass at the ready. Let's crack her open. I got it. I got it. I'm here. Very nice. Okay, so 9536. What we're looking at here on this brand new beautiful livery. This is one of 215 bottles. Uh, it's a nine year old. It's from the 15th of September, 2010. It's a space side. It's a second fill ex bourbon barrel. And uh, it came out at 66.1% ABB. Which is alcohol by volume, by the way. A lot of people seem confused about what ABB is. And in fact, 
Interestingly, I, I've i never even noticed, but it doesn't even say ABV on SNWS bottles. It actually says alk dot slash vol dot. So yeah, alcohol by volume. Um, or if you're in the biz, ABV. Mm. Beautiful. A little, little bit of glare going on there. These, uh, these new labels are uh, not quite working with my lighting setup here. I might have to change that for next time, but hopefully you can kind of see what's going on. Maybe if I just move it over here. I don't, does that help? Yeah, that's a little better. All right, I'll put the whiskeys on this side from now on. Hmm. Hmm, smells good. All right, but clip. Guide me through this again. Bench pressing tea cakes. Deadlifting marshmallows. Ah, brilliant. Yeah, I'm getting a little cinnamon on the nose. That's uh, that's that's putting that's setting me off. That's putting me in the right direction. A little cinnamon, a little, little yeah. It is a little bit, a little bit light woody, a little bit um, beech or pine maybe, but you know, very very light dusting. Oh yeah, and there's yeah, just just right there. There's a little touch of uh, tobacco, and I'd say licorice as well. Yeah, if you look past the, the, the lighter, more floral uh, sort of notes that are coming through and the sweeter marshmallowy notes, there is actually a bit of a bit of a darkness to this. Hmm. The dark in the light. It's the, the yin yang of whiskies. Hmm. Oh yeah. That's ginger. Ginger, a little bit of aniseed. That is quite spicy actually. So this is from the Young and Sprightly um, um, collection. <laughs> I like to say collection. I'm sticking with it. Uh, the Young and Sprightly collection from the SNWS. I think profile is the right word. Hmm. I've got a bit of punch to it. And this is the kind of whiskey that I... Uh, I mean, I feel naughty. I should have put a little bit of water in that Klein leash, but... Uh, well. I liked it very much the way it was. And... Uh, I've got time to go back and experiment with water a little bit later. Um, but I am naughty. I should have done that on camera for you, but I will make sure I do it on this one because I think this one, I think, sounds like I would prefer it after a couple of drops of water. Because uh, it, it says much more, um, much more, much more interesting notes for me. Vanilla, herbs, they're the kind of notes I like looking for in a whiskey. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure marshmallows and uh, not sure marshmallows and aniseed are necessarily the flavors I personally look for as much. So if I see vanilla, love, I love a nice a nice vanilla -y whiskey. Sweet honey. Yeah, I do I do quite like the, uh, the the ginger note. It's coming through on the nose much more after water now as well. Let's see if I can find that big heavy hitting wood. Not sure I'm finding big, heavy hitting wood, but I am finding heaps more ginger. Slightly, almost, um, imagine like the Japanese pickle ginger you get with sushi, but without the pickle, I guess. <laughs> like a salty ginger. There's no there's no vinegar taste to it at all, but it's that, it's that kind of level of ginger flavor with a touch of salt. Hmm. I'm definitely getting licorice flavors in this one now. That's, uh, that's, that's, one of the things that I'm getting quite strongly that the SNWS doesn't really seem to um, emphasize too much. It says aniseed as a, as a sub-note there, but yeah, I'm, I'm definitely getting licorice as one of the more prominent notes on this, which is good. I, I like licorice in a whiskey. And my old colleague Dan Rampling couldn't stand licorice in a whiskey, but, you know, Dan Rampling is wrong. We all know this. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing with whiskey. If you're, if you're somewhat of a not necessarily a picky eater, but if you have things that you dislike in in the realm of food, um, that are sometimes found in a whiskey. Sometimes a whiskey might be a fantastic whiskey, but just that one note might throw you off. So if you are someone who doesn't like licorice, I would recommend maybe not buying this without trying it first, because um, I think there's a chance you might find. Uh, might find the note not quite to your liking, but for those of you who love licorice, like like myself, um, this is this is solid solid whiskey. This is really nice. 
It's especially solid because I, I can see the price right here, which you'll, you'll, you'll get told at the end of the video, but it's especially solid for the price. Hmm. So, what is 95? Well, 95 is Athrask, which I think I'm pronouncing right. Um, I, I watched a YouTube video to, to practice my pronunciation. It looks like it should be pronounced Outroisk. Um, but yes, no, apparently Athrask. Um, it is specifically designed to be a nutty and dry whiskey, and it does that by utilizing rapid mashing techniques and a quick hot blast in a mash still. It was founded in 1972, so a relatively recent whiskey, and released as a single malt in 1986 under the name Singleton of Athrask. That didn't last very long, however. Singleton um, is now a name that is affiliated with other whiskies, uh, Glen Ord, Glen Doolan, and... Uh, uh, Dufton, that's the one we have here. Um, that trilogy of whiskies is actually one of the uh, makes up one of the best selling um, malt whiskey brands in the world, the Singleton, um, which I still think is a little bit cheating because Singleton is three whiskies, not one. Yet somehow it gets listed in the top ten best selling. Um, but either way, uh, this is the original Singleton, and I'm not entirely sure the reason it stopped being a Singleton. I do know that uh, it. It was quite well received at the time. Um, prominent whiskey writers talk very highly about the original Singleton of a Thrask release. But yeah, it's, um, it just didn't continue. Um, whether that was that they found that it was needed for blends and didn't have enough stock for uh, a single malt, or whether they just decided to go in a different direction as a company, I'm not entirely sure. But I think they should bring it back, because this is this is a very unique and interesting, nice little dram. Um, yeah. If you fancy an Athrask, this man might be for you. Now, let's see what whiskey number four is. Mm, and whiskey number four looks delightful. Okay. Glass at the ready. Let's find the notes. So, we go from bodybuilders in ball gowns to 3 a.m. Donna kebabs. <laughs> yep. Um, and that is something so unbelievably British in culture that it just made me sad slightly when I first read the name of this whiskey because it just made me want to be 19 and in Edinburgh and eating a Donna kebab at 3 a.m. I know exactly the store I would go to. I can't remember the name, but it's, uh, it's just off the South Bridge. Oh. Oh, actually, Rob and Kelly are in Edinburgh right now, and whether they're watching this live or on tape today, hi, hi Rob and Kelly. Um, once your two-week quarantine is up, I recommend going and getting a 3 a.m. Donna kebab. It's uh, a life-changing experience. Actually, it's perfect. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite work out for you this time, but next time you arrive in Edinburgh severely jet-lagged, 3 a.m. Donna kebab. It's, it's a great breakfast. All right. This looks cool. Let's find out what notes we've got here. A furtive nose of ferrets, cowsheds, fishing harbors, old medicine, sheep, sheep fanks. I don't know what a fank is. Um, yeah. Write to me um, at, uh, at whiskey at strathlicker.com with your definition of fanks, because uh, I'd love to know. F-A-N-K-S. Uh, sheep fanks, engine bits, eviscerated tractors. <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, lemon infused oil, beach stones, hospital corridors, playing sweaty squash with a farmer using a preserved lemon. <laughs> oh my god. Alright, composure. Uh, moss, seashells, unsweetened herbal liqueurs, and hot smoked mussels. Add water to this beautiful madness and you get antiseptic cream, smoked woolen undergarments. <laughs> Putty, mercurochrome, pineapple jam, smoky grist cakes, wildflowers, coastal paddling over st what? Coastal paddling and over steep Lapsang Souchong tea. We're only halfway through. Quick to the palate. Muesli bonfires, barbecued peach stones, ham hock wrapped in burlap. <laughs> Why would you wrap uh algae smoothies? <laughs> It's the next big thing, guys. Go go scrape the algae off your pond and put it in a smoothie. Game meats, engine oils, mineral salts on fire. <laughs> Hot sand mixed with lemon balm and vapor rubs. <laughs> Cask I'm crying. Cask strength cough syrup. Swimming alone in a weird pond. 
<laughs> some of that pond water and you smoke add some of that pond water and you get smoked mineral oils pine resin mint extract lamb stock posh 3am donna kebabs petrichor tar liqueur herbal toothpaste and essence of gravel <laughs> Oh my god. A marvel out of time upon which to found a new religion. <laughs> oh, yeah, this is this is how Scientology starts, guys. Um, <laughs> with a 3 a.m. Donna kebab. Holy crap. Okay. I already couldn't wait for this whiskey. I am glad I waited to <laughs> read these tasting notes until I was on camera. That is absolutely freaking nuts. And um, if you're wondering, that sounds like a hell of a dram. We're not even halfway through the, 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 the tasting yet. What could possibly follow it? You'd be right. This is one hell of a dram. And it is possibly, you know, number four is a weird position for a dram of this caliber um but just you wait and see what we've got coming after it because there's <laughs> some interesting things happening soon but for now 3 a.m donna kebabs is 93.124 and i cannot wait <laughs> to see if i can find what was it sweaty squash game using a, lem a preserved lemon instead of a bowl <laughs> oh Very nice. That was the sound of a preserved lemon hitting a squash racket. Um, beautiful. So what can I tell you about 3am Donna Kebabs, apart from they are a great way of making sure you don't have too bad of a hangover. Um, so this is 93.124. It is one of 223 bottles that came out of a refill ex-Bourbon Hogshead. It was distilled on the 7th of February 2003 in the town region of Campbellton, uh, making it 16 years old. It is fresh out the cask at 53.6% ABV and then time capsuled in this lovely bottle for your drinking pleasure. Okay, yeah, that I can kind of tell why the tasting notes went off on a random tangent because that is um, a mad schmuzzle, I would say, of uh, flavors. Not sure where I picked up the word schmuzzle. Great word. Sounds Yiddish. Mm. Probably should have smelt it a bit more before tasting it, but I really want. Ooh, I really wanted to get into the palate. Because <laughs> I was finding the nose a little shy. And often if I take a tiny sip and then go back to the nose, I'll, uh, I'll be able to unlock its secrets a little more. Secrets of eviscerated tractors. All right, for real though, let's, let's, let's see if I can actually find any of these mad, mad tasting notes. So, I've never smelled a ferret, so can't help with that. Does smell a little cow shed like, in a good way. Fishing Harbors, absolutely. Ooh. That unlocked a memory. So normally when I think of Fishing Harbors, I think of uh, Grimsby. Because I grew up in a, um, for a few years, uh, between the ages of, I think, two and six, I, I lived in a small town called Cleethorpes, which is a, a seaside resort um, in, in England. And we're just around the corner from one of the biggest fish ports, Grimsby, um, which is about as nice as the name suggests. It's Grim speed um so that's often my first port of call when i try and think of like fishing harbors and that kind of that kind of note um and other ones that i'm very familiar with the, the little fishing harbor in um in, in wellington where the market is as well when i lived in new zealand um that's that's often my my second go-to and then sometimes down in leith but uh this has reminded me of a fishing harbor long since forgotten and it's a combination of notes that i found on the nose that have reminded me of this um my parents uh, <laughs> i'm not sure if they got duped into it or it was actually a really good deal I, I wasn't really paying attention to the money at the time but i, I really liked the experience um my parents got a timeshare uh, <laughs> which uh, normally is a big no-no but we thoroughly enjoyed our timeshare a timeshare at a hotel in malta and uh, sometimes you know if you go back to the same place every year 
kind of get tired of doing the same touristy things again and again and again. So we got onto a random bus that, you know, isn't a tourist destination at all. And one time we went to a tiny little fishing village. Um, and I can't, I can't remember the name of this village. It probably had 12 X's and 13 Y's if it was, if other Maltese towns or anything to go by for the names, which is probably why I can't remember it. Um, but yeah, this tiny little fishing village. And this smells like that because not only are we getting that um, that big um, that sort of coastal fishing village smell, um, but I'm getting freshly baked bread. And I have this distinct memory of sitting in a playground outside of a bakery eating fresh rolls because we couldn't find a cafe or a restaurant. It was so not touristy that the only thing we could find to eat for lunch was just going to a bakery and eating bread. Um, so we ate bread uh, under a lemon tree bread under a lemon tree in a coastal village in Malta. That is what this smells like to me. I thought I was going to love this whiskey because I love 3am Donna Kebabs. Turns out I love this whiskey, at least one of the reasons I love this whiskey, is because it reminds me of childhood holidays in a Mediterranean fishing village. Whiskey's magic. Mm. Now that is... That is spectacular on the palate. It tastes exactly like an eviscerated tractor. Now, there's a lot of things going on here. It's peatier than I expected. So it's under the oily and coastal um, category, which is one of the reasons I placed it where I did in the lineup here. Um, and it's it's a little, it's, it's definitely one of the oily and coastal ones that could also fit in lightly peated, but because it's oily and coastal, they've, they've put that label on it. But yeah, this is definitely lightly peated. Um, yeah, no, it's it's got smoked muesli, smoked muesli on the palate, which they call them muesli bonfires. Um, yeah, I don't know when you would normally smoke muesli, but this is good. Barbecued peach stones, again, why would you barbecue a peach stone? Makes no sense, but this is good, and I can definitely see where that flavor is coming from. Ham hocks wrapped in burlap. I'm not sure why the burlap's coming in, but there is a sort of smoky bacon thing going on, so that kind of makes sense. Algae smoothies. Now, I don't know I don't know what I'm looking for with the tasting note algae smoothie, I have to say. It doesn't, doesn't taste... It doesn't taste to me like dirty pond water, but maybe I've not just been drinking... I've just not been drinking from the right dirty pond. I think that's my problem here. Um... This is one of those whiskies which is full of the, the the asterisk. The asterisk that you've probably heard me talk about before. The um, asterisk, but in a good way, uh, on a tasting note. It, it does. It weirdly does taste like engine oil, but in a good way. Um, no, this is absolutely delightful. And I'm not surprised it's delightful because it's a cast strength whiskey from one of my favorite distilleries. Uh, a distillery which I didn't realize was my favorite, one of my favorites until relatively recently. Actually... There's three whiskies in this outturn, which I would consider in my, at the moment, top five whiskies, uh, which is really exciting for me personally. Klein Misch, we've already seen, is one of them. This is another, um, which means we've got one more to come. Um, but this is a Glen Scotia. This is Campbellton's Forgotten Son, uh, I, I feel. Everyone's always talking about uh, talking about Kilcarran, and of course, uh, um, it's very well known sister distillery and uh, owner Springbank. But uh, I think that Glen Scotia often gets, uh, yeah, just forgotten about. It's, it's overlooked somewhat. And uh, I think it's a fantastic, fantastic distillery with a lot of complexity and breadth to it. Complexity and breadth, which, which can come up with, quite frankly, a TARDIS of flavor that is what is in my glass right now. There's everything under the sun in here. It's great. But no, Glen Scotia is uh, um, in Campbellton, and much like its neighbour Springbank, they actually make three distinct new make spirits. Um, a unpeated, a peated, and a heavily peated spirit. However, they don't actually have separate names for them, as they usually blend them together for their official malts uh, offerings um, to create a sort of more consistent medium peat level or light peat level, depending on the bottling they're doing. Um, however, because of this, their single cask offerings that you get uh, sometimes as official bottlings, but often through independent bottlers such as this. Um, very wildly, you get 
you can get some very, very different Glen Scotias, and uh, more so than a lot of distilleries that do have uh, separate codes. Actually, Glen Scotia is owned by the same company that does Loch Lomond, which of course now infamously has like eight different <laughs> SWS codes. I don't know if it's actually eight, it might be. Two grains, four malts. Yeah, I think we're up to six. I think we're up to six different uh, Glen Sco uh, uh, different uh, Loch Lomans. But Glen Scotia only has the one code because it actually only has one technique. It just has different levels of malt. But somehow they managed to create an absolute cacophony of flavors um, out of their out of their stills. And yeah, slightly hit and miss. Sometimes you'll get one that just tastes like a burnt rubber dinghy. Um, not you know, sometimes some people love that. But uh, yeah, I mean. Because of the crazy variety you can get from Glen Scotia, there's always there's a little bit more risk, but the reward is oh so great. Um, yeah, this is fantastic. And actually, I recommend um, one of the uh, Dram Association premium exclusives right now, which is about to become a general release. Um, and actually, it might be a general release by the time the video airs, is the um, Glen Scotia Victoriana, which is their official bottling cast strength no age statement, which is frankly not as good as this in any way, but is definitely something that you would want to do a side by side with this and it's you know nowhere near the uh, the price of this because this is a much better presented single cask single malt rather than a non edge statement uh, official bottling but if you did want to do a side by side um i i would recommend it i'm probably going to do that myself later on today because i really like the glen scotia victoriana i think it's a fantastic whiskey especially for the price also I'm slightly proud because we have the uh, provincial exclusive on it, and it's actually significantly cheaper at the Strath than it is in uh, in Alberta, which is rare. <laughs> but no, this is this is absolutely delightful. I am I am very happy with my three AM dollar kebabs. You know. I almost forgot that's what it was called, and as I was saying it, the uh, the memory of the whiskey in my mouth, I finished there, had a greasy lamb, mint sauce, yogurt, kebab thing going on. The only thing missing is the hot sauce, which I'm not sure I'd want in this whiskey, to be honest. Um, sometimes you don't want hot sauce in your, in your 3am donut kebabs. Especially if you had a curry earlier that night, you don't want to punish your stomach too much. Um, man, it feels like I'm in Edinburgh right now. It really does. <laughs> mm. That, ladies and gentlemen, as you can probably tell by the fact that I've almost finished my glass, is definitely getting a big thumbs up from me. Um, yeah, that is, that is very good. Let's uh, shuffle these glasses along, make room for the new guy, and move into the back row, as we call it uh, here at the Strath. Uh, normally when we do our tastings, the glasses are in rows of four. Um, in fact, the bo my bottles are in rows of four today as well, so it's legitimately a back row for me as well today. Um, the back row, known for being a little bit stronger in flavour usually than the front row, although might not be the case today. Um, but this next one is something very interesting. Very interesting indeed, for it is called... Now, I'm not quite sure I'm going to get this right. Uh, I don't know how long to, to do one, two, three, the four O's in this, but I think it's called Suturns. Suturns. <laughs> um, sweetness strikes first. Milk chocolate, honey cake, icing sugar, assorted sweet dessert wines, mushroom powder, old wine cellar, aged Tokai, fragrant wines, herbal toothpaste, sheep wool, praline, cafe latte, and Brazil nut. A little reduction brings out mulling spices, minced meat, sultanas, stewed and old cognac, fruit loaf, pecan pie, pomegranate molasses, and posh custard made with old masala wine. The neat palate is full of sweetened Earl Grey tea, molten fudge, lavender icing, pine resin, tea tree oil, fruit extracts, herbal infused oils, old Madeira, sponge cake, and glazed fruits. With water, there's mint fudge, maraschino cherry juices, bitter orange peel, Manhattan cocktail, olive oil cake. Olive oil cake? What the hell is that? Uh, blackcurrant wine gums, furniture polish, sweet waxes, and elderflower cordial. Matured in a bourbon hogshead for a number of years before being transferred into an ex-sauternes barrique. 
for the final two years. Yes, an ex sort Hearns whiskey. Something delightful, something relatively rare, and something that I generally thoroughly enjoy. Um, let's see how this one goes. So Turns, I think, is a very interesting choice for a fortified wine for a whiskey finish um, because of that botrytis effect that uh, is uh, is the cause for the sweetness of Sauternes wine. It also, I feel, leaves a little bit of funk, which transitions into the whiskey, and I like a funky whiskey. So yeah, there's a little, little bit... Ooh, got the cap, didn't get the... Got the outer cap, didn't get the inner cap. Ooh, she can't wait to get out. Here we go. Very nice. Nice, deep, rich, yellowy, golden color. Mm. So this is 48.110. It is one of 184 bottles to come out of this Exoterns Barrique. Uh, it was distilled on the 8th of March 2004, making it 15 years old. It's from the Speyside region, and it is cask strength, of course, as always, at 56.6 alcohol by volume. Oh, we're off camera. Shovel this way. <laughs> um, yeah. Delightful. I, I can't wait, so I won't. Maraschino cherries, right off the nose. I think that was a palate note in the tasting notes, the official notes, but yeah. Right off, maraschino is definitely, definitely in there. Mm. Touch of mint. Spearmint, specifically spearmint. It's very, very refreshing smelling. It, it smells like it smells like the effect of having an ice cold shower after running in the heat, which is something I try not to do very often. Um, but yeah, if you're if you're if you're a runner, if you enjoy jogging or jogging, I think it's a soft J, um, and uh, and you're 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 used to getting hot and sweaty on a really hot day and then having a very refreshing ice cold shower afterwards, that is the effect I'm kind of getting without any of that having to run in the heat. Um, so just give it up. Don't 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 even bother jogging anymore. Just buy a bottle of this. Um, yeah, no, that's that's very pleasant. Why does it smell refreshing? I'm, I'm not used to things smelling refreshing. What, let's see if I can pinpoint that note. What, what's going on here? One of the things my... What, so I'm not really getting the deeper notes that it mentions here. Let's see if I can find some of them. Cafe Latte and Brazil Nuts. Pralines. Hmm. All right. I just this moment realized I never added water to that fence kosher. I'm, I'm, I'm getting very bad at adding water to these whiskeys on the video, apparently. My apologies, but in my defense, it was freaking delicious, and I just forgot about it. <laughs> um... I will try not to forget about this. I won't get lost in it. I'll try not to get lost in it. Mention of pecan pie. I can kind of see that. Sweet, sweet pecan. Mmm. 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 Mm-hmm. Yep. That's good. That is singing a beautiful song. Whereas the 3 a.m. Donna Kebabs was somewhat of a, I don't know, maybe a bit of a party anthem, a bit of a, bit of a brim full of Asha, maybe something a little bit out there, a little bit wacky, maybe um, Chawamba Wumba type of thumping. This is somewhat more of a, I don't know, some, somewhat more of a, a beautifully constructed ballad, but with a very powerful voice singing it. Lover or hater, Celine Dion has a hell of a uh, hell of a voice box, and that's the kind of thing I'm getting here. It is a very clean, powerful voice over this really beautiful, harmonious, delicate, almost orchestral background. A 
but it is slightly angsty at the same time. It's got a, it does have that little funk, not in a funk music, but in a funk flavor. Mmm. Maybe more Alanis Morissette. I think if you've ever heard Alanis Morissette do one of her sort of later in life, slower, more ballady kind of tunes, but she still has that sort of teenage angst deep beneath it, although she's, you know, maybe in her 30s and 40s by the time she recorded that song. That is the kind of thing that might be going on here. There's there's something there's something a little bit deeper inside. Mm. Oh, okay. I need to add water before I finish it. A couple of drops. Open you up. Let's see. Hmm. Marmalade on toast. That was an unexpected change of pace. That diva is now um, making herself a coffee and uh, wearing slippers and a big, comfortable, fluffy toweling robe. It's it's a breakfast diva. Yeah, I'm actually getting, legitimately now getting that cafe latte note. Yeah, it's, it's coffee and marmalade on toast. Water makes it a breakfast whiskey. Who knew? Um... Yeah, that is. That's quite delightful. Mm. So yeah, um, in case you missed it in the in the earlier notes, two years it spent in the Sawtones cask. So uh, fifteen years old means it means it spent thirteen years in the uh, in the hogshead prior to being finished. I don't know if it's really a finish for two years. It's a it's a recasking. It's yeah, which is yeah, which is a strange thing. Like recasking a whiskey. Maybe not necessarily into a different type of cask. Uh, is it's a very old traditional thing. It's, it's it's quite common. It's not it's not as new and shiny as a lot of uh, spinsters will make you. I said spinsters. I don't mean a spinster like a spinster. I mean a spinster like someone that spins spins something. Anyway, um, <laughs> it's not it's not this brand new revelation new thing that a lot of uh, marketing companies will tell you. It's something that's actually been happening for a very long time. Um, the idea of recasking a whiskey uh, or re-racking a whiskey, um, but yeah, doing it to this kind of effect where you've you've had it in an ex bourbon and then you want to infuse some different types of flavors into it um, is something that can be very, very good if done well. Hmm. That, yep, yeah, that gets a big thumbs up in my book. Well, it's official. Let's see what the next whiskey holds. So whiskey number six today. If you're wondering where this tasting is headed next, well, we're going on a voyage. We are going on a beautiful voyage. We're taking a pirate ship in a storm. Mm. Oh, you know, I got so lost in that last whiskey, I never even told you where it's from. This is why I need Brett here to keep me on track. All right. Let's go back to 48 Mont Ponto. This, yep, okay, rewind the tape. 48 is Balmenic. <laughs> um, Balmenic is a pretty traditional space cider, um, and it still uses worm tub condensers, giving it a hefty spirit, which is perfect for maturation in sherry and other fortified wine casks, such as this Sauternes cask. Um, it was licensed in 1824, but was operating apparently long before that as an illicit still. Um, it did close down in 1993, but was thankfully resurrected in 1997, where it has found a huge success under um, uh, under new management, especially with its Caron Gin. Uh, yeah, it makes gin at this distillery as well. Um, Caron is available at the Strath for 53.83. You can pick it up at strathlicker.com and have it delivered with your SWS whiskies if you would like to try another wonderful Scottish gin. And speaking of Scottish gins. I had the delightful experience the other weekend of sampling two Scottish gins and a Scottish gin liqueur um, that are created by a fantastic new distillery in Edinburgh. And that distillery will hopefully be coming our way um, into uh, BC sooner rather than later. But uh, keep an eye out on my social media for my uh, reviews and impressions on that. And it's especially exciting because it's a distillery that Robin Kelly of SNWS Canada had a uh, huge hand in uh, creating. So um, keep an eye out for that. Mm. 
All right, I think we, we can now officially move on to the next one. I, I'm ready to board that pirate ship. We've, we've done everything. All right. Have we done everything? I think we've done everything. Okay. Next whiskey. Glass at the ready. Pirate ship in a storm. What do we got? Barrels of rich fruits and sweet spice rolled from the glass like a shipment of rum and raisin ice cream on a storm-torn pirate ship. <laughs> I'm in. That's, that's, I'm in. Uh, nutmeg and cloves united with Brazil nuts, dates, and prune juice to create a succulent storm that rained down a torrent of mulled wine and onion gravy. Then fudge, butterscotch, and banana bread delivered rich and sweet flavors that cascaded into coffee, orange, and truffle oil. With water, pine forests appeared with almonds and walnuts that sweetened into marzipan. Burnt notes of soft brown sugar and singed sultanas married with calvados before ginger and blackcurrants appeared. Finally, maple syrup balanced a spinach that was dominated by pumpkin seeds and bitter chocolate and dry tree bark. Hmm. Dry tree bark. Sound... Not, not sure I'm, I'm sold by the idea of something that tastes like dry tree bark, but everything else sounds fantastic. And it's funny. I don't like marzipan, but any time that a, a whiskey writer says that a whiskey tastes like marzipan, I really often like it. Um, because I taste actual almonds and actual, uh, like an actual sweetness, not an artificial sweetness and artificial almonds, which is often what I get in marzipan. But it's possible that I haven't had good marzipan. Uh, so if anyone has a good lead for me on uh, on on an actual really good marzipan in uh, in uh, in Victoria, let me know. I'd like to try some good stuff. Maybe my lifetime hatred of marzipan is actually based on really cheap rubbish marzipan on store bought Christmas cake. Um, but it's time to board the pirate ship in a storm. Speaking of storms, we actually had one in Victoria a couple of weeks ago. It was quite exciting. One of the things I, I miss about uh, not living in Victoria is the storms, but we actually had a storm. It's like it knew that I wanted to travel and I couldn't, so it brought the storm to me. Ooh. All right. Very nice, very nice. Very nice, very nice. Okay. So... Pirate Ship in a Storm comes to you from Distillery 44. It is 44.116. Barrels of uh, rum and raisin ice cream, it says. Oh, I can't wait. So this is one of 567. That's right. You only get those kind of numbers when it comes from a big butt. And this is from a big Oloroso butt. A second fill Oloroso butt for its entire maturation. This is another Space Cider from the 20th of April 2011, making it eight years old, and it is cask strength at a magnificent and, frankly, terrifying 68.2. Oh, yeah. That will sanitize you. Mm. All right. I keep forgetting. I'm having the bottles over here this time because of the glare. There we go. It's good. Oh. Oh boy, mm, that is a big meaty. Mm. So this, so we had a sherry bomb last month and people absolutely loved it. Everyone that bought a bottle, it went very, very quickly. Everyone that bought a bottle um, got back to me. And, well, not everyone, but a lot of people that bought a bottle got back to me and gave me their opinions after cracking it open. And it's a very well loved whiskey. Um, and that was the, the Tullabardine that we had uh, last month. And every time someone mentioned really loving it, I, I couldn't help but think in the back of my head, yeah, I, I really, I really, really enjoyed it. But I just wish the balance of sherry to spirit was a little, little bit more balanced. I mean, if you love those flavors, then power to you, go for those flavors. And, you know, I'm never going to have trouble selling a first fill sherry cask whiskey like that because it has legions of fans. But in my personal taste, I like a whiskey like this that, yes, is sherry cask. And yes, it's sherry cask for its full maturation, but it's a second fill sherry cask. So it doesn't take on as much of those basically you could just be drinking castor and sherry kind of notes. Um, it lets the spirit sing. And this is another spirit, much like the Balmenic, um, that has a lot to say. Mm. 
And that is absolutely astounding on the nose. Can't, for the life of me, pinpoint anything, but it smells glorious. Let's see if I can actually get something without the notes help again before I uh, revisit those notes. What am I getting here? I am getting a flambéed Christmas pudding. You know when you, you you cover it in rum and set it on fire? I'm getting that. I'm not just... It's not like a mince pie filling kind of whiskey. You know, that often you get the sherry bomb, you just get like stewed raisins and things. There's, there's more to it than that. There's a spirity flavor, which is why I'm adding the rum there. It's almost like having, yes, a mince pie, but with a very big helping of brandy butter with it, which... It's something that you don't see very often here, and that's a, that's a shame. Brandy butter is a fantastic um, dessert condiment. <laughs> mm. Oh my. Oh. Oh, what is that? I think, we're, I think a truck is pulling up for a delivery in the alleyway outside, so... Apologies for the extra noise right now. Oh. But the Sticky Wicket has to have its fresh produce. I will not deny them of that. <laughs> mm. What is that? That is magnificent. But I can't tell what it is. I'm going to have to look for clues. Alright. What am, I, what am I looking for in here? Is it banana bread? No, that's not. I mean, it might be in there, but it's not what I'm tasting right now. It's a little more savory than banana bread. Onion gravy? Yorkshire, it's Yorkshire puddings. It's Yorkshire puddings with a big, thick gravy on it. But it's somehow a sweet gravy. And that's the thing. Yorkshire puddings, which, you know, I'm, I'm kind of from Yorkshire, so uh, I, I know a thing or two about a Yorkshire pudding. Um... It's a, it's a fantastic thing, um, and a lot of people don't realize it does work as a dessert. If you, you, you know, instead of putting gravy on that bad boy, if you put some custard on there, it's absolutely delightful. And that, it feels like someone has gone ahead and defied all convention and poured both on here. Because it's somehow both deliciously savory and meaty, but also at the same time sweet and creamy. Um, which I think most culinary experts would not advise actually putting custard and gravy onto your um, Yorkshire pudding. But in the case of this whiskey, this really, really works. This works to a disturbing level, to be honest. I'm having a hard time picking a favourite so far. Ah, there we go. it's probably the 3 a.m. Donna Kebabs, but this might be a close second. <laughs> Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Black currants. Oh, oh, it's drying now. If you put more than just a sand, my standard tiny sip into your mouth and let it sit there for a while, when you swallow it, it almost feels like it's taking a layer off, like, you know, pink thinner kind of style. I think that's probably the high ABV. But when it leaves behind this, it leaves behind this slightly tender tongue, which is taking on all kinds of prickly, peppery notes just from the air left behind, the vapors left in your mouth. That is a delightful sensation. I really should try this with water though, shouldn't I? I mean, what is it? 60? 60, 68? 68 68.2%. Probably be good to see what it's like with a few drops. That might not even be enough, to be honest. Um, we'll see where it's at. I might add a couple more. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Sherry. Sherry in perfect harmony with whiskey. But not battling against each other. This is a marriage of sherry and whiskey. Hmm. Add a bit more. See if it changes it more. Got a little nuttier there, I have to say. Couldn't find too many changes apart from a little, little, 
Not a nut yet. Mmm. There we are with it. An addition, an extra addition of water there. It's um, suddenly creamed fudge. It's a lot of the fruity sherry notes have calmed down now and it's getting a little bit more sweeter and more almost more bourbon casky to be honest which is interesting uh, but yeah it's definitely got that fudgy vanilla thing going on now that that is a feat of engineering that is a magnificent dram and uh, let's talk about where it's from so this is from distillery 44 which is Craigalaki. Um, and whilst it's a few decades younger than Balmedic, the last tram that we had, it's actually got a lot in common with it. And one of the things it has in common is the use of worm tubs. Um, so for that same heftier new make spirit, which again stands up to, uh, uh, to sherry cask maturation really well. And yeah, which makes sense with this one. It's so big and rich and meaty. Um, the owners of this distillery, Doers, actually released it as a single malt in 2014. Um, and now, six years later, the 13-year-old Craig Allerke is uh, become a stable in um, a staple rather in many folks' home bar setups because it's frankly incredible value, and incredible value is something that is not unique to the official bottlings, but also spreads across to a lot of their independent bottlings as well. Whenever I see a Craig Allerke, I'm usually surprised and delighted. Um, at its comparative price tag to uh, other more well-known spirits of this style. Because like Craig Ellicke, to me, it fits in exactly the same sort of, um, exactly the same region as Mortlock, which is often thought of as one of those premium whiskies. Just carrying the name Mortlock alone will double the price almost. And Craig Ellicke, to me, is as good, if not better, than Mortlock at being that style of whiskey. Mm, can't wait to release this. And it's not long now, we're up to Whiskey 7. Ah, Whiskey 7. I almost feel bad not having this as Whiskey 8 because by name, by all rights, it should be. Um, because Whiskey 7 is called A Perfect Finish to a Perfect Day. Mm. This is a sweet, seductive, smoky aroma mesmerized us like a barbecue in a pine tree forest near a sandy bay where every so often a salty sea breeze rustled through the trees. That's a sentence. That's a very long sentence. The taste neat had a touch of spice, an earthy floral note, and plenty of fried bacon in salted butter with sweet maple syrup in the finish. With water, dim the light, play soft music, and serve scallops in an Asian-style dressing. Do not forget the Chablis. <laughs> After that, take a bottle of this whiskey and settle in for the night. A perfect finish to a perfect day. So what I'm hearing here is this is the perfect whiskey for... Something which I, I feel like is a phenomenon that a lot of couples are having right now, which is not really talked about, the new phenomenon of COVID date night. Um, a, you know, making a big deal of having a date night at home, getting some really nice, uh, really nice food. In this case, apparently uh, scallops um, in Asian style dressing and settling in for the night with just a really nice glass of whiskey, some really nice wine and uh, maybe some form of entertainment, maybe a, a, a nice record maybe even Netflix. Um, but yes, I feel like, by the sound of it, this is the perfect COVID date night whiskey. <laughs> Alrighty, let's see if a perfect finish to a perfect day lives up to expectation. And I have high expectations because, as I mentioned before, three of my, at the moment, top five distilleries are being represented in this tasting, and this is the last of them. This is the third. Hmm. Oh, then again, the next one is definitely in my top ten. Um, let's give this a go. Nice straw light colour. And it's got exactly what I look for in a whiskey like this. And this is lightly peated, as you can tell by this light green colour. And this is cask number, society cask number, 66.163. There's a lot of nodding heads at home right now going, ah, oh, yeah, I knew it was a 66. Uh, it is outturn one of 164. So it, that is, uh, uh, <laughs> some people are quite confused about the fact that it now says outturn on the bottles. Um, 
Outturn, yes, is the name of the monthly testings, but it's called that because outturn actually means how many bottles you get out of a cask. Um, so the outturn of this cask is 164, and it is in the September outturn. Same word, different use. Um, but yeah, this is uh, from the 27th of October 2010, making it an 8-year-old. It is a Highland. It is a second fill ex-bourbon barrel, and it is bottled at 59.3% alcohol by volume. 66. A lot of you know how much I love a 66. Let's get a little bit closer up. There we go. I should put a little circle on the table for where to put the bottle. Next time. Next time, Adam. Alrighty. Mm. That is a lot peatier on the palate than it is on the nose. Mm. Yeah, I'm getting wood fire, bacon. Mm. This say fried bacon. I always find it interesting how Ardmore reminds me of the sea so much more than a lot of island distilleries despite being a mainland. I mean, it's near the coast, I guess, but still. Um, yeah, I mean, but it is a much more foresty kind of barbecue sauce flavor, which is interesting. Mm. Yeah, honestly, the tasting notes on this one are spot on. I feel like they're a little bit more zoomed in, a little bit more centered. Um, Maybe not many people on the on the council. Maybe this is a COVID council tasting note. Less people, spaced apart a little more. Uh, but yeah, this does feel a little bit more, yeah, focused. Sweet, seductive, smoky aroma. It's exactly, exactly right. It is sweet, smoky, mesquite, mesquite smoke. It does smell very barbecuey. But there is, yeah, sesame, sesame oil as well. Maybe that's the Asian style dressing. Sesame. Very, very Asian centric flavour. I should have a sip of water. Um, let's add a couple of drops. Mm. Yeah, now this is. I'm sorry if I don't sound as excited about this whiskey as I do with other ones. It's not because I don't like it. It's because whereas other whiskeys, I'm often shocked and excited and, you know, intrigued by interesting flavors that I weren't expected. This is exactly, exactly what I expect from this distillery. And that doesn't mean that I'm not excited by it. I am. I love it. I absolutely love it. But it means my excitement is much more... If, it's less excitement and more satisfaction, actually. This is a deeply satisfying whiskey for me. It's it's much more calm content. You know, actually, I, I, I agree with my uh, summation of the notes. I think this would make a fantastic COVID date night whiskey. It's not going to get you riled up. It's going to calm you down. It's going to make you relax. If you're a fan of Distillery 66 like I am, don't overlook this whiskey. This this is I don't think this is going to last very long, to be honest. And if it does, I'll be relatively shocked because this this is a quintessential Ardmore. And Ardmore is a absolute favorite distillery of mine. And actually, um, for those of you who might have missed one of the other videos where I redacted some information, I, I've gone on at length in past tastings about how Ardmore was the last coal-fired still in Scotland, which I have recently discovered to be not correct. So I'm redacting that. Um, it was a, the second last. Um, it was actually, um, there was a, a couple of years where after Ardmore uh, fired 
um, stopped firing their coal-fired stills um, that a neighbouring Victorian-era Highland malt uh, distillery, the Glendronach, actually still used a coal-fired still. So Glendronach was the last, Ardmore being the second last. However, one thing that Ardmore did that I believe Glendronach didn't is they actually... Um, they actually created a new form of coiled steam heating for their stills to replicate the hot spots that coal created. Because that's the whole point with coal-fired stills and the reason a lot of people miss the era of coal-fired stills and why Yoichi in Japan is quite sought after because it's apparently the last one now that uses coal-fired stills. It's because those hot spots that are created by, you know, natural pockets of more, you know, more uh, fuel. Um, will actually make the uh, the liquid inside the still move more. It gives it much more movement. It makes it a much more volatile uh, process. Um, so by creating hot spots in their heating system, Ardmore have managed to recreate that process, which is really neat. It was built in 1898 to produce whiskey for Adam Teacher's namesake blend, Teacher's. Um, and in recent years, and I think it's quite rightly become a bit of a cult favourite around the world now. Um, they Beam Centauri, the new owners, as of, uh, I think, 2014, maybe. I'm not quite sure about that. Um, but Beam Centauri, their new owners, have released a couple of single malts, although we only get one here in BC, which is driving me nuts. They have a 20-year-old port cask available in Europe, which I want to put on our shelves, but they won't import it here. And I... Yeah. Um, but it's okay, because... Uh, Ardmore is one of these distilleries which is not shy about sharing some of its best whiskey with independent bottlers. It, I mean, most of its whiskey goes into blends anyway. Um, but you get some absolutely incredible, incredible whiskies coming from Ardmore through various independent bottlers. And SNWS is um, probably the creme de la creme of Ardmore bottlers. And um, I'm always excited when I get one. I think I actually have nine SNWS Ardmores at home. Uh, which means I might not be buying this one simply because I can't fit it on my shelf. But if I manage to finish another bottle of Ardmore that I've already got, um, and this one's still available, I will definitely pick one up. <laughs> mm. Yes, a perfect finish to a perfect day, um, which I guess means the day is over. Uh, we don't have a whiskey number eight. Any oh, no, wait, yes, we do. And it's very exciting looking. Um, uh, it's exciting to me because it has a pun in the name, and I love a good pun. Um, but I guess it means if the day is over, this is a nighttime whiskey, and I expect it will probably fit that bill quite nicely. It is time for gauze and effect. That's right, gauze and effect. Uh, we've pulled into a petrol station, um, that's a gas station for you North American folk, um, forecourt, um, I don't think, probably don't need to translate forecourt, by the sea. Um, peated minerals, chalk, Febreze and lemon-scented fabric softener fill the air. Then come lobster pots, freshly creosoted fence posts, a stick of dynamite, and a freshly washed hospital corridor. With water, there's a spritz of fresh lemon juice, a spray paint, old marmite, sun-dried kelp, oyster sauce, lemon thyme, and barbecue scallops. The palate is immensely chiseled and medicinal. Raw sea salt, frying bacon, smoke kirsch, peated oats. Peated oats? Is that a thing? Oh, I want that. Peated porridge. Um, grilling whelks, heather ale, sea greens, and pure brine. Reduction opens up notes of juniper, damson panna cotta, green peppercorns in brine, beach sand, old broiler sheds, candle wax, and iodine tablets. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. I'm really glad that it said juniper in there, because a lot of people have been doubting uh, doubting something I've been saying recently that this distillery often has a juniper note and that's something that I have picked up on and noticed myself after reading it in I think it was the Whiskey Atlas um, one of uh, one of Dave, Bro uh, Dave Broom's books or it might have been Dave Broom's website but Dave Broom put me onto the fact that juniper is a prominent note of this distillery and I'm glad that the SNWS agrees with me on this one let's check it out it's peated <laughs> is it peated or heavily peated? I think it's just peated. It's peated. It's not quite heavily peated. I've had very few heavily peated things in the SNWS. But then again, I've often thought that a lot of the things that the SNWS releases that are just peated are actually very heavily peated. So I don't, I don't know where they draw the line. Hmm. I know the malt spec for this distillery is described as heavily peated. So I think it's 45 ppm. 
So this, ladies and gentlemen, is distillery 53, and it's 53.275. It's one of 253 bottles from a refill hogshead, ex bourbon, from Isla, of course. Um, and it was distilled on the 24th of September 2007. And uh, bizarrely enough, despite being distilled 13 years ago this month, it was actually only 10 years old, so it was bottled a couple of years ago now. It comes to you at cast strength 59.9% alcohol by volume. Ah, yes. It's nice to have an Isla in the mix. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Alright, creosote on the nose. My god, that was creosote on the nose. Yep. That very much reminds me of my my first job. Um, where I tell people my first job was a grave digger. That's not entirely true. I did dig graves, but I was actually the sexton. So I was uh, involved in uh, general keep of the, uh, the churchyard as well. The graveyard, not just digging the graves, but also, you know, putting up fences, uh, mowing the lawn, that kind of that kind of thing. Um, yeah, this this takes me back there quite off, quite quite a bit. Mm. Yeah, very very creosote. Lobster pots is another thing it mentions here. I'm not sure where they're getting Febreze from. I thought the whole point of Febreze was it didn't smell of anything. This definitely smells of something. Um, fabric soft. Oh, fabric softener. Yeah, I could I, I could bait her maybe. There is something a little bit, a little, a slight bit soapy in a good way on this. Um, really good way, actually. Marmite. It says Marmite after water. I haven't found it yet, but I will go looking for that after water. Let's try the pot. Oh. Yeah, that is iodine to the max. If I was tasting this blind, I would definitely think it was a 29, not a 53. That, for any of you who are massive fans of 29 and are unable to get any SNWS 29s right now because, the, you know, they go to draws and the price is quite high, this, this is a good alternative. This is quite iodine -y. This is very, very Lefroydian. Hmm. So bacon. <clears throat> I'm not sure I'm getting smoked pork, but I'm definitely getting smoked something. Almost like smoked fish. It's more like a cold smoked cod, you know, the yellow cod. Or maybe kippers. Yeah, I'm not sure about bacon on this one necessarily, but no, that is something I often find in this distillery, so maybe I'm just not looking hard enough. Maybe it'll turn up after water. Should have some water. I should also have some water to myself. I've definitely not been drinking enough. Ooh. I'm not sure I get bacon meat, but bacon fat now on the palate. It's creamy. It reminds me of, um, of the Highland Games about three years ago. Um, I think it was Corey from The Whole Beast. It, it, yeah, it was. It was definitely Corey from The Whole Beast made some uh, uh, some bacon fat caramels, where they use bacon fat instead of butter in a caramel. Oh. This, this, this is a bacon fat caramel. <laughs> Mm, yeah, the smoke is now less singular. It's it's expanded um, as, as gases do. It's expanded to fill the room, and in doing so, it's become a little thinner, and uh, letting you can see the room a little better. It's uh, there's there's more going on all of a sudden after the water. The barmite, marmite, yeah, it's it's got that salty yeast extract thing going on. Uh, for those of you who haven't had marmite. Um, you should. You should try Marmite. It's, it's a great flavor. It's something I often find in whiskey, but also a lot of people don't realize it's very multi-purpose. Uh, you don't just you can't you don't just spread it on toast. You can also use it um, in uh, in gravies and sauces and things. The same kind of any time you would use something like let's say Maggi seasoning or something in a stir fry, you can add a little teaspoon of Marmite to it. It's great. Um, but I always laugh when I see 
um, Americans especially when they're doing these challenge YouTube video challenges where they're trying British things or um, Australian things or whatever um, they uh, they'll try Marmite or Vegemite and uh, they'll pile it on like it's bloody Nutella onto a slice of toast and it just I love Marmite but seeing anyone take a bite out of like Nutella thickness spread toast Marmite just makes me want to gag there's a reason it comes in tiny bottles it is a very very potent mixture you, you you put it on in very very light sort of almost you sort of waft it towards the toast you don't actually put much on like a pea size thing on a whole thing of toast perfect mm. yeah definitely marmite oyster sauce yeah yeah that's a Mm. This is a quintessential Isla whiskey um, from what I would say is definitely the most consistent distillery. Um, I've said this many times about this distillery. The highs are not necessarily as high as some of the other ones, but the lows are so much better. Like this is, it's it's so consistent. You you will always get a certain great quality of whiskey from this distillery. Um, yeah, I mean other distilleries. Yeah, I, it's, it's hard to say. I've have had some really really good whiskey from this distillery, but it it, it does seem to have uh, a ceiling that it, it doesn't seem to pass that other distilleries nearby it do pass. But at that exact same time, I've never had a whiskey from this distillery that I would say is utterly disappointing in or disappointing at all really like I've had some terrible terrible Lefroigs I love Lefroig I've had some terrible Lefroigs I've had some god awful Lagavulins I've had Ardbegs which are, didn't even want to finish the glass I've never thought that about Kalila I just haven't um it's so beautifully consistent like Kalila is one of those distilleries where if I if I don't have any whiskey, say I'm on holiday and I, I need a bottle of whiskey, I didn't bring any with me, and I want something peated, and I don't have an opportunity to say before I buy, I pick up a Kalila, because I can practically guarantee it's going to be great. It's not going to be amazing, necessarily. It could, could be pretty damn good, but it's always going to be satisfying. It's always going to be great. Um, but yeah, Kalila, interesting. It, it gets exactly the same spec of malt from exactly the same place, Port Allen Maltings, as its sister distillery, uh, Lagavulin. However, Kalila's distillation methods, including taller stills, um, actually help create a lighter whiskey. Uh, it wasn't until 2002 that it was released as a single malt, not because they didn't think it would be successful earlier than that, but because it's so sought after as a blending ingredient that they didn't really have any to spare. And still to this day, this is one of the whiskies which blenders flock to for that exact same reason that i enjoy it for that consistency you can you can commission kalila to make you 200 casks of whiskey for your blend and wait six years until it's ready to be blended and know that it will turn out perfect there's no worry like the return on investment is very stable it's the gold it's the gold level you know gold's expensive uh, but it will always go up This is not, you're not buying Bitcoin when you buy a Kalila. Mm. That was a beautiful way to finish off an outturn. As much as I I did thoroughly enjoy the name of uh, the, per what was it, the perfect way to finish a perfect day? The perfect finish to a perfect day. This is the perfect finish to a, as close to a perfect outturn as I can remember. This, this has been a beautiful journey to go on. Um, I feel slightly sad that Brett couldn't go on it with me, but hopefully, if the if the numbers drop again in the next coming months, uh, we'll uh, we'll be feel safe enough that uh, I can share the couch once again. But until then, hopefully, you'll uh, enjoy putting up with just me on my own. It has been an absolute pleasure to host this outturn, and it is an even more pleasure to say the whiskies are available to purchase right now. So you'll see on the screen the uh, the, the full details again of uh, these whiskies with the prices. Uh, for those of you who don't fancy reading, I'll recite them right now for you. Uh, Candy Floss and Carousels is $170.35. That's that beautiful uh, beautiful um, Kleinleash uh, that we started off with. Then we've got the Bodybuilders in Ball Gowns, the Athrask, 
um, Task 9536, that is $169.48. So the first two are, you know, great, great value there in that $170 range. Um, heading up now to 3 a.m. Donna Kebabs, a whiskey which I was hooked on by name alone and then found completely different tasting notes of my own that made me even more in love with it. 3 a.m. Donna Kebabs, worth it for the hilarious tasting notes alone. This is cask 93124. It is $227 and 74 cents. Get it while you can. Uh, next up, we had a rarity, of course, in the SWS these days, or in, in whiskey these days, Sauternes cask finished whiskey. You, you don't see this very often. Um, and this is a beautiful, beautiful expression from Balmenic, a, a spirit which can really hold up to that style of cask finishing. And this. I can't believe I'm saying this. This 15-year-old whiskey is $177.30. $177.30. Absolutely magnificent. Uh, next, we go to a pirate ship on a storm. Uh, and this pirate ship on a storm is uh, from a second fill Oloroso boat. It is the 44.116. It is that beautiful sherried Craig Ellicke that we had. Um, it is, again... Outstanding value at $152.09, $152.09. Um, moving into the perfect finish to a perfect day. 66.163 can be yours for under $150. This is $149.48, a cracker of a whiskey for that price. An incredible eight-year-old Ardmore, absolutely wonderful. And to finish off, we take our trip to Isla. This Kalila is 10 years old. Um, it is beautifully peated. 53.275 can be yours. Goes in effect for 194.70. Whew, that was a hell of an outturn. And I, like I said at the beginning, I officially say that whiskey season is on. Now is uh, the start of um, the official 2020 2021 whiskey season. Um, it's going to be a hell of a ride. This is a fantastic way to start it. Um, here at Drinking Out Loud, we're going to be doing the, the long-awaited and long-promised um, grain tasting. The uh, Indie Showcase grain tasting is going to come up soon. We were planning to do it before this tasting, but it didn't quite work out. But it will be happening in the next week or two. Um, we've got a fantastic, um, just just an amazing um, uh, Blackadder snake pit coming up as well with our new partners um, the the uh, the Angry Otter co-op over in the mainland uh, with Roberto Roberti um, that is going to be coming up really soon as well. Plus, we're hopefully going to have a guest presented tasting with uh, the the Strath alumni, our, our our own friend, the great Pat Dunlop, who is now representing some Japanese whiskey here on Vancouver Island. Uh, so Pat's going to come onto the show and uh, teach us a little bit about his new portfolio of Japanese whiskies. Uh, really looking forward to that as well. Um, we will officially be having our annual sale in November, um, in case any of you are worried about that, that will be happening. And uh, yeah, it's been a slice. Take care, I will see you at the next Drinking Out Loud. Slash of our. Near for you, my body, Lassio. Oh, the Sharon's near for you, my body, Lassio. Oh, the Sharon's near for you, for your back it wouldn't boom, and your belly is round and full, my body. Lassio, it was in the month of May, my body. Lassio, it was in the month of May, my body. Lassio, it was in the month of May, when the flowers they were gay. And the lambs did sport and play, my bonnie Lassie-o 
Do you mind on yonder hill, my bonnie laddie o? Do you mind on yonder hill, my bonnie laddie o? Do you mind on yonder hill, where you swore you would me kill? If you didn't have your will, my bonnie laddie o? Oh, the shearing's near for you, my bonnie lassie o. Oh, the shearing's near for you, my bonnie lassie o. Oh, the shearing's near for you. Fear back, it would nibble, and your belly's round and full, my bonnie. I see you. That is near, I'll kill you dead, my body. Kill you dear, my bonnie lassie And it's nay I'll kill you dead Nor mark your body bled But I'll marry you instead My bonnie lassie Oh, the sharing's nay for you My bonnie lassie Sharon's day for you, my bonnie lassie. Oh, oh the Sharon's day for you. Be a packet of maple, and your belly's round and full, my bonnie lassie. Oh.